Order, silence in court. Order, silence in court. I would like to declare the case of movie trialers versus the accused now open. Welcome to the movie trials. In the dock today, one of the sacred cows of horror, Stanley Kubrick's 1980 movie, The Shining. Looking to put a bolt through this bovine's brains, representing the movie trialers, I am your host and the prosecution, I am Smart Alec. Sat beside me is the defendant, fighting to save this aged heifer, a lover of both horror and The Shining, not Irish, Pat. Say hello, Pat. Hello, Pat. <laughs> I see what you did there. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm not going to hurt you, okay? I just want to make that clear. Okay, okay. I'm excited to be here. But you didn't let me finish. Okay. I'm not going to hurt you. Yeah. I'm just going to bash your brains in. Wow. Okay. We'll I'm just going to bash your brains in. We'll see about that. We'll <laughs> see about that, Alec. The Shining stands accused of being overrated in the second degree. How do you plead? Not guilty. Your Honour and the jury, I put it to you that The Shining is an incredibly overrated film. Yes, it was directed by Stanley Kubrick, one of the visionary directors in Hollywood. Yes, it stars Jack Nicholson, an Academy Award winning actor. Yes, the source material was written by Stephen King, a prolific writer in his genre. And in theory, all of these elements mixed together should create one of the great films of our time. This is not the greatest horror film of all time. I feel that it's not Stanley Kubrick's greatest film. I feel that many people have seen this film once or twice a very long time ago, and their impressions at the time were good. However, I feel it definitely does not stand up to those initial impressions. And if people were to go back and rewatch this film and compare it to new, recent releases, I think people would change their opinion of this film, and it wouldn't be considered the cult classic that it is. The main reason that it stands accused today of being overrated is that this film is far too funny to be considered the best horror film. It's dated very badly. Its actors are out of control. There are many random moments in this film that completely spoil it for me and do not hold up to this day. And ultimately, I feel that the man himself, Stanley Kubrick, dropped the ball with this film. I feel that there are other far superior horror films out there that could easily be critically compared to this and come out on top. It's these reasons that lead me to think it's not the pinnacle of horror that many tout it to be, including my guest who sits beside me. This is the case against The Shining. Now I invite you, the jury, to listen to what we have to say and reach a verdict. Thank you. So Pat, you agree with me that this film is incredibly overrated, right? Uh, no, funnily enough, not at all. No, I think it's one of the uh, greatest horror movies of all time. It scared me shitless as a... When you were 12. Well, yeah, and um, ever since then, really, it's it's held up, and, and I constantly get reminded of how good so it is. So when you recently rewatched this, you genuinely thought it was scary? Yeah, definitely. Let's talk about why it's dated first. Okay. And first and foremost, okay, let's speak about why it's dated because I think that's going to be a key issue. Okay. You say it still evokes the same fears. Yeah. I don't believe it is dated. Do you not? No. So you didn't burst out laughing when it cut to shots of the kid's face, Alfred Hitchcock style, just 
you know, of him a ridiculous expression. Well, yeah, I mean, there are certain scenes that could have been done better, especially with Danny. Um, I thought his overall performance was really good, however. It was. I mean, it, it's difficult, you know, he's a child actor and, and he didn't really understand the film as he was filming it. I'm not sure I understood the film <laughs> as I was watching it. <laughs> um, but no, I mean... I, I would say that there are some scenes that the realism is taken out slightly. There are some classic and very iconic scenes in this film. And many people will say these things, that these are some of the greatest, most iconic moments in horror. For example, you have the elevator mm. spurting blood. blood. It's not even a spurt, that's a waterfall of fluid. Blood, yeah. It's a, a, flood flood, of blood. a flood of blood. A flood of blood, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a flood of blood. Yeah. That's a pretty horrifying image, yeah. even without the score. Jump cut, close up, to Danny's face. Yeah. It was a lame shot. We watched that, and we laughed. Hmm. It's just silly. Well, at the beginning of the film, you know, the, the acting is, is great, it's fine. And then towards the end, the horror starts unravelling. The characters seem manic. And yes, some people, like... You know, yourself, you were <laughs> laughing quite a bit towards the end at, at some of the acting, but I just think you must realise these people have been in isolation from the world and they're at a point of hysteria, especially, you know, the woman. She's gone completely doolally. Well, they, they both have. And uh... it's, funny, it's funny that you say that I laugh because there were five of us. All of us laughed in unison at many parts of this film. I haven't heard that many people laugh at a horror film since I sat down to watch Shaun of the Dead. <laughs> yeah. Well, so it's a very successful horror-comedy hybrid, maybe. Well, but I don't see Shaun of the Dead topping many horror lists. And that film's brilliantly directed by Edgar Wright. <laughs> it is, yeah. Well, as I said, you know, I think that the, the characters have reached a point of hysteria. Some people find, you know, can find that funny. And Well, there's another moment. So, yeah, the very, very famous scene where Danny's riding around on his his little tricycle. Yeah. Just riding along. Camera mm. steady cam, which was new for the film. Mm. Uh, tracking behind him. Yeah. Really cool scene. The Simpsons have parodied that. They have, yeah. Um, you know you've made it when the Simpsons parody you. <laughs> yeah. And you come to the, the two girls, mm. who I will agree are pretty terrifying. Yeah. And the scariest part for me still is when it flashes to both of them dead on the floor, yeah. murdered, and then goes back to them being their ghostly selves. Yeah. Again, jump cut. Close up Danny's horrified expression. And I'm just laughing again. No, I mean, I disagree with that. I mean, the, the scene that you were talking about before when he was sort of freaking out and frothing at the mouth. <laughs> that, uh, yeah, I mean, that was, you know, a bit hysterical. <laughs> um, but no, I disagree with, with that. That scene, as you rightly described, is terrifying. Um, the shot still sticks in my mind as being absolutely terrifying because... You don't know what's coming around the corner. There's, I think there's about three shots of that. Him mm. riding around the, the mansion. And then the very last one mm. is a shot to, to the two girls. These, you know, ghosts or wh whatever you call the them. The build-up is good. Yeah. But then there's that. There's it's such a, a hokey shot. Okay, okay. It's like a really poorly executed homage to Alfred Hitchcock. And it dates very badly. Because it doesn't fit with the rest of the style of the film. If you look at Psycho or something, the whole film's like that. There's a moment where um, the detective is walking up the stairs and um, Norman Bates runs out and stabs him. And then yeah. there's a close-up of his face when he's falling. Yeah. I mean, it's 1960, though, so you, you let that go. Whereas in The Shining, it's the 80s. You know, Alien came out a year before this. Yeah. And we all know how I feel about Alien. Yeah. Um, <laughs> we do, we do. Yeah, but this, there's no excuses in this film. Stanley Kubrick's a prolific director. He no is. one's going to deny that, and I'm not going to sit here bashing his legacy because mm. he is one of the one of the great Hollywood directors, without a doubt. Of course, but no one is above criticism, and I think there's a lot to criticize about this film. Okay, well, as you said, with that shot, you know, it's the reaction of a of a young boy not believing what he's seeing. He covers his eyes and it slowly opens them. And I think that's just, that's like the reaction of, of a small child. Okay, so let's go to another scene. Right. 
because I'm gonna I'm gonna keep picking out these little scenes. Go for it. So, the scariest scene when I first saw this film, which I think when I was 15, hmm. I was watching it on my TV in my room upstairs alone, as everyone should do when they watch a horror film. Definitely. Unless they've got friends, probably didn't at the time. <laughs> it's irrelevant. <laughs> it's the scene with the room. Do you remember the room number? Two three seven. Well done. Who could forget? Well, me. <laughs> Danny has the strangle marks around his neck. Yeah. Jack Torrance, played by Jack Nicholson, goes to this room that's been foreshadowed earlier mm. by... Um... So Danny mentions the room. He okay. says, what's in room 237? And, okay. and uh, Scatman, <laughs> Dick, um, <laughs> says, you don't think about it, basically. Yeah. It's foreshadowed and yeah. foreshadowed well. Yeah. Definitely. And it's a point of view shot. It's Jack Torrance. He walks into the room... And you feel tense, you're yeah. sweating, yeah. it's really well built up, and you walk through into the bathroom, and then you can just about make out the figure, who you know someone's having a bath because you can hear it, mm. and they pull back the curtain, and it's this fairly attractive, naked woman. That was terrifying. Oh, especially. And even now, even now, that, that was still scary. That's right? probably, I agree with, that's my one of the scariest uh, scenes, when he realises that it's an old, decaying woman. And he backs away after well, kissing her. I hadn't quite reached that part yet. Okay. Because when I first watched it, yes, my uh, thinking was completely aligned with yours. Yeah. Horrifying. But I was a child. Right. Watching it now, the makeup does not hold up at all. Yeah. Especially on an HD television. Mm. Or of you to even project it. It was just clearly some old lady with really badly done makeup. I mean, again, it was just like another shot in the face. You know, my shoulders slumped, and I was like, okay, that was the best part of the film as far as I could remember. Yeah. And it's just not that good anymore. Yeah, I mean, I agree, because as you go on in years, these films, the CGI, the makeup is, you know, it's poor. We live in a time now where makeup has improved vastly cgi it makes it making things very believable mm. so at the time you know 1980s at the time um yes this this is the best they could do at the time but well, I, I don't, don't think... I completely disagree with that i think this has been surpassed by earlier films in regards to its makeup there are better films around this time before this time yes you know the makeup isn't great but it's that fact of that's not what makes it scary you know it's that it's that sort of transformation of the woman you know we we see him kissing a a, a beautiful woman and and she turns into this decaying thing and i think the 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 horror comes from that that thought and him sort of backing away and 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 the old decaying zombie, ghost, whatever it is, coming towards him and laughing. She's laughing. Yeah, I'm la laughing. laughing hysterically. Everyone's laughing. This film has just become a comedy because of some of these dated elements. Mm. I feel that that scene becomes hilarious. Yes, her laughing when you're terrified, it can almost exacerbate that feeling, but her laughing when I'm smirking at the terrible makeup down her arms and it's just some pretty much naked old woman walking mm. around. That's probably a more horrifying aspect to that scene <laughs> than anything else. Yeah. That, that makes me laugh. And mm. If I was to show this to a young person now, or someone who hadn't seen other, other horror films, maybe, maybe someone has avoided horror their whole life, they'll go on a website and see The Shining. This is the greatest. This is the pinnacle. Mm. And then they'll watch scenes like that and they'll, they'll think, this is, this is tacky. I don't know. I... Parts like that are tacky and then they won't delve any further into like, the genre. Yeah, it's, it's just one of many parts I felt really let it down. Okay, I mean, if you look at it superficially like that, yes, okay, I understand what you're saying, but I, I don't know, it, it still scares me because of that sort of uneasy feeling I get. You know, why is this woman there, you know, in the first place, in this mysterious room? And why does she turn into this old decaying lady? Another scene that comes to mind is... Danny's sort of alter ego, um, I, f I forgot the name of it now, but it, you know, where he puts his finger up yeah. and he talks to himself. That gives me such an uneasy feeling. It, it's, you know, it's a small child and he, and, and he's doing that. He's obviously got some 
problems there. Okay, so this is encroaching a little bit into later points, maybe. Okay. Just because of the subject matter and the reason for that. Mm. So in the novel, Jack has had a problem with alcoholism. Yeah. And has been abusive. Yeah. And it's a very natural and common occurrence for a child to create fantasies around himself. Yeah. Um, it's a comforting tool. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I feel The Shining, this version, does a very poor job of actually approaching that subject matter. Mm. It treats it almost as part of the horror. I, a lot of people would probably say that it's alluding to the fact that these things happened in the past, but I, I actually don't think that comes off strongly enough. It's We're maybe giving Kubrick a bit too much credit at this point. But also, like the red, the red rum scene. Yeah. Again, another thing that maybe in the 70s people would have been scared by murder backwards but i was just like okay murder so that's another scene that that gets to me um the way he repeats red rum it's just it's it's very uneasy it makes me feel really uneasy him repeating that in a high pitch tone and and it makes me genuinely scared and that sort of backstory of the alluding to some sort of abuse on on, on the child Again, adds to the uneasy feeling. There's a scene where Jack tells him to sit on his knee, say, you know, um, I, I'm, I would never hurt you, uh, in a really creepy sort of way. So it seems like that, that allude to the fact that Kubrick is aiming for something deeper here. There's little hints. Uh, yeah, so his wife, her first thought when uh, she saw the neck marks on him was he'd gone back to his old ways. And I'm, I'm going to agree with you about that scene. It was very well done. Mm -hmm. um, it was a good, subtle performance from Jack Nicholson. One of the very few in this film, and that's another issue I have with this film, that his performance was anything but subtle. And if there had been more scenes like this, then maybe this would never have even been considered for a trial. It's a glimpse of what the film could have been. These are the big scenes. There's many moments that just add to the plethora of hilarity that mm. you can find now. Okay. Um, there's a random shot of a bloke laughing for no particular reason. He's just sort of laughing. I, mean, I think he has a fantastic moustache and he's, he's just chuckling away and it's, it's just silly. It's when Wendy's running around with a baseball bat. Yeah. Going a bit mad. There's a moment with... I think she's come up the stairs and then she looks into a room and there's a guy really badly dressed up as a pig. A bear. A bear. Mm. Okay. A bear. Mm. And a gentleman. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's just like, what the fuck? I understand they're trying to make it like a dream thing, but that was stupid. It was, it was shite. What I would say, Kubrick isn't a director that just does things randomly. We know that Kubrick is a perfectionist and, and he films many takes and in past films, for example, Clockwork Orange, there's certain scenes that uh, don't make sense at first, but then when you really look into them, there's there's hidden meaning there and uh, The Shining is no different. But the Clockwork Orange is the blackest of comedies. This is meant to be scary. He did not mean for this to be funny. But it's still a Kubrick film, and he's got his own style, so everything... His style is fantastic throughout, mm -hmm. but it's not his style that is really in question here. It's a beautiful picture of a film, mm. but that alone doesn't make it one of the great horror films. Well, what I would say is those scenes are there for a reason. Every shot is there for a reason. Um, the props are there for, for a reason, and that's another reason why this film is great. So you say it's meticulous. Mm -hmm. How come he couldn't get Wendy's part right? This is the thing. These actors, okay, first of all, they had to retake a lot of scenes. Um, and I think this was very deliberate. If we think about, you know, um, the, the setting, they've been at this hotel for, uh, I don't know how many months, you know, in total isolation, the radio's not working, they're, they're going crazy, basically, and they've just totally lost it. You know, <laughs> if you've stayed home for a long period of time, you go a little bit crazy. Yeah. Um, this is to, obviously, a whole new level. It's just getting, it's just, 
hysteria, basically. It's very, very interesting that you say that. Jack Nicholson goes from naught to crazy before they even reach the hotel. Even driving in the car, he looks mad. Yeah, I mean... It's such a poorly weighted performance, especially given the source material where it's meant to be a slow degradation of right. a man who's reformed from alcoholism, right. reformed from abuse, who is then going to this place that, because it's on an ancient Indian burial ground, right. starts to draw out the worst in him and make him go mad. This is just Jack Nicholson prepping for his role as the Joker in the Batman, because... <laughs> That's all I saw watching this. It, yeah. it was just madness. Yeah. From uh, the off. And yeah. that doesn't that's not a good performance. That's an out of control performance. Yeah, well what what I can say to that is there uh, yes, I do agree that at the beginning there is that hint of madness already showing. But dollar. as you said I'd call it a dollar, <laughs> a dollar <laughs> of madness already showing. I mean it's not quite there. He's still sort of uh, fine. Um but th- there is that sense, of course. But that transition to full-blown craziness is only after there's a jump two months later. You know, this film can only be so long, and that makes it more believable. This guy has been in total isolation, trying to write a novel um, in a massive hotel uh, for a while now. You know, this isn't after a couple of days. That would be unbelievable. This is a reformed alcoholic who, after two months, total isolation has gone crazy. My point is he's gone crazy before they even reach the hotel, before the two months later. He's just crazy. He's just Jack Nicholson right from the off. But maybe that's how the character's supposed to be. But it's not how the character's supposed to be. In the Stephen King novel. Which is the novel, yeah. Oh, I don't know. I I disagree. And if you forget that there was even a book, the whole purpose of the hotel is the the hallucinations and bringing the evil out in everyone. Right. He's evil from the start, so there is nothing to bring out of him. He's just mad. I don't think he was like that in the beginning. I just think he had certain issues, definitely. The isolation just exacerbates it. I, I think it's very believable. I think, yes, he has. He is a man with skeletons in his closet, but he would never go to the level of trying to kill his family if it wasn't for the fact well, that... He's, he's already tried to. I mean, he's probably thinking about it already in the car journey down, based on the way he looked. I I, I don't believe that. If, if you do believe that, you know, he, he uh, abused Danny... Well, or... he states that he's starting to try and start up a new life. That's part of the reason why he wants to go there in the first place. Exactly. But just saying it and actually acting it, didn't it didn't come across like that from his performance. I'd like to also bring up two key characters. There aren't very many characters in this film. No. We've already touched on her. Hmm. This is Wendy Torrance. Yeah. yeah. One of the worst, most misogynistic viewpoint characters I've ever seen on screen. She's weak, wet. She runs around flailing her arms all over the place. She has that annoying expression. Mm. I would have wanted to bash her brains <laughs> in after having to put up with her. <laughs> And I definitely do not advocate any sort of domestic abuse. (laughs) But she was awful. It was an awful character. And that, to me, because this isn't a sign of the times. You have strong female characters. You only have to look at, like, Terminator and Alien and other films around that period. And that's just sci-fi. Yeah. And that's really starting to come through, these strong characters. This is a very dated character. Maybe that's a reflection on Stanley Kubrick. Because that character, I know, was not written like that in the books. That's come all from him. Mm, mm. There's, there's a few differences to the film uh, and the book. But, um, but just specifically her. Yeah, yeah. Terrible. And right. she is very important. She is. I, what I would say is, um, you know, she's a woman that loves her family. So she would do anything for her family. He gets the offer to to go to this hotel for the purpose of writing his book. She wants to make that happen for him. She's doing it for her family, um, and that's the character that she is. Um, He he later, further on in the film, he says, I'm not going to let you ruin this again. I think that's a hint of maybe she, she feels that she's held him back in the past, and I feel that's why she... You know, wants another chance at, uh, uh, you know, this is Jack's moment. Um, I'm here to support him. I, I want to be here for him and for my family. And, and that's 
that's why she is the way she is. Well, she's written like a character, it's meant to be written like a character who's been in an abusive relationship. But right. just like, you did this! You did this! When she runs in with Danny and there's the marks. And, it, and then you see her sort of trot away, like arms flaying around. It was, it was laughable and it was pathetic. And Well, I would say... That you know, makes this film dated because that isn't something that I want to show people. She's hysteric. She's hysteric. When when you see people in films when they're hysteric, they're they're just all over the place, you know. Um, Have Kubrick... you met someone like this in real life? No, I haven't because I've never met anyone as hysteric as she is. Um, towards the beginning of the film, that type of personality, yeah. But this to me goes back to overacting, out of control performances. Okay, next character that is also dated mm. is Dick. Okay the token character that he is. He's a plot device, and he's so badly drawn, I'd call it racist, or at least borderline racist portrayal of a character. And yes, you could say it's in its time. It's a very dated role. He's so two-dimensional. Mm. And he's purely there so that he can deliver some exposition about The Shining, and then come back to give uh, Wendy and Danny a ride out of there at the end. Mm. And to and to show that um, Jack's now gone crazy and he's killing everyone because mm. he kills him. But it's, to me, that was a very dated role because no one would accept that role now. This is like the stereotypical friendly, jolly black guy who's yeah. just there to come and help someone out and yeah. then... You know, there's nothing else to him. He has no dreams, no aspirations, no fears... And, I mean, yeah, okay, there's the shining thing and he sits in bed and he's shining away. I mean, it's basically Wendy. He's just another Wendy to me, as in this is a clearly dated character that just doesn't hold up anymore. Mm. And he's part of the film like any other part of the film. And yeah. as you said, Stanley Kubrick doesn't make mistakes. He's very focused. Right. So this is all deliberate. I, I was laughing because it was just... His role, his entire role is ridiculous. Well, I mean, I don't, I don't agree with that. I, I feel that his role, it just added to the mystery, you know, like, well, what, what is this shining? Why is he there? How does he know that, you know, um, Danny has it? Again, it, it, it makes you feel uneasy. He, as a character, made me feel uneasy. And it's funny that you should mention that racism. I think Jack um, calls him a nigger at one point. Yeah, uh, him and the... Was he an English waiter? Right. They call him, they call him a nigger. Yeah. And it's interesting because that stereotype that you mention, I, I agree with it, and it makes you feel uneasy. And this is an overarching sort of meaning in, in The Shining. It, ma it makes you feel uneasy. It, it, it makes you feel uncomfortable. He's portrayed this... Uh, of stereotypical the time, of the stereotype, time yeah. stereotype and that's for a reason I think this is an instance where it worked at the time but now we've moved a long way from there yeah it just again it's something funny well if you're not going to laugh at it you're going to get angry at it there's not I don't think there's any other way of looking at that well to me it's a multi-layered film if it made you feel uneasy then maybe that's some underlying guilt on your part you know, I didn't find it un uneasy. I just found it ridiculous, quite frankly. Well, there's there's many reasons for the uneasiness. That was one, um, but it's just his character as a whole. Talking to, to Danny, a, a person, a, you know, the boy that he's just met, in the way that he does, it's just an un uneasy feeling. I mean, their characters were pretty much on the same mental level as each other. Right. That's how they were portrayed. Right. That's awful. I know. But why? This is what I mean. This this film, The Shining, is multi-layered. It's a horror film, of course. It's 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 a horror film, but there's underlying sort of themes which um, Kubrick hints at so well, and that's another reason as to why this film is a masterpiece because it's so interesting. It it makes you think. You know, when we watched it, um, there were some scenes where we were like, "Why is that there? Like, that's ridiculous. Why is that there?" When you start to think about it, um, well, I didn't. I don't. Sorry to interrupt you. I yeah, didn't. I didn't feel that I had to think about it that much. I thought it was fairly self-explanatory. This is a haunted hotel. Lots of things are going on in it that are part of the dreams and fears of these characters, mm. and that you got a family that has been through a lot has come there. They've gone a bit mad. And they're killing each other or running away from each other. There's nothing more to it. It's not this deep really psychologically challenging film 
unless you really struggle to pay attention to something and have completely missed the point, it was just it's just a horror film. Well, maybe maybe that's the audience member. Maybe it's what you expect of the film. You know, for me personally, I I look at a film and I see it for what it is, but then I I want to know more about it, and especially a Kubrick film who is very meticulous in what he does and there are underlying themes in his films all the more reason to question certain aspects of the film there are many really interesting weird horror films out there but most people don't feel obliged to necessarily go out and research these films this relates back to the original charge why does this get preferential treatment to other films because it's this prolific director, he gets a free pass, everyone assumes that even if it's bad, there has to be deeper meaning to it, there has to be more. You know, I'm just too stupid to work it out, because he's this good a director. I think that he doesn't get a free pass. We know Kubrick, we know what films he's made, and we know his methods. And so that makes you, you know, question certain parts of the film, um, try and understand a deeper meaning. And this, this film, it was a, a foundation to many horror films today. The suspense, the shots, um, well, I mean, it holds Kubrick, up. Kubrick didn't create suspense, you know. No, of course he didn't, but there was certain atmospheric tension. I'd compare this film to Nightmare on Elm Street. Nightmare on Elm Street, at the time, was horrifying. Mm. It's made by one of the masters of the genre. It had many original ideas in it, which mm -hmm. you could say that The Shining does have. Definitely. But now, many of the special effects are absolutely ridiculous, and they look stupid, and many people... They don't give that film the same level of recognition they give this film. They, you know, there's the scene where... Um, Freddy Krueger's arms stretch out down the alleyway and you can clearly see they're like held up by wires and it looks absolutely silly and yeah. I put them in the same camp as each other The Shining and Nightmare on Elm Street both have things to say about the human condition yeah. and about children and you know they've got many of the same themes but no one treats that film like it's a paragon of the genre whereas this I said that I was going to have this on trial and I had comments like, oh, you can't say something bad about The Shining. Mm. I, I understand where you're coming from with the you know, Nightmare on Elm Street um, comparison, but what this film does and why it's considered such a classic is the, the tension, the, the atmosphere, the uneasiness. No other film, be that horror or whatever genre, has made me feel that way. The setting of being in a, in a massive hotel. I remember staying at large houses when I was younger, because my mum's a carer, and we used to stay there, just me and her, when I was younger. And I got that feeling even then. There's, there's all these rooms around, three bathrooms, um, four spare rooms, and I just got a sense of uneasiness because they should be f full of people. And it's the same with, with this hotel. It's a massive plot of land. And, and there's only three people there. You know, we, we see the kitchen, a massive kitchen. And it's empty. It just feels so, so uneasy. But I feel all the points you're picking up on are all just pretty much related to how masterfully Kubrick shot the film. But that's not the content of the film. You know, you're talking about a fantastic exercise in creating atmosphere and displaying a setting in a certain way. Mm -hmm. But that's only half of what makes up a film. And, you know, that half's fine. It's, it looks great. But that, that alone is not enough to make it... I'm not saying this is a shit film, because mm. it definitely isn't. Yeah. You know, I'm just going to put that out there. It's, <laughs> it's not. It's not bad. I'm not calling it awful. I'm calling it overrated. Yeah, sure. And many people say this is the best, mm. and it's not the best. Mm. It has, it has flaws. Yeah, and I'm trying to highlight the flaws in this film, and that's what I'm trying to say that this is guilty of. It's guilty of having flaws and not being quite the film that people remember because a because it's dated, which we've talked about. Yeah, and b the characters, the out of control performances. We've already spoken about Wendy. Mm batshit crazy, ridiculous performance. 
Um, but the number one person is obviously Jack Nicholson's character, mm. uh, Jack Torrance. He's so twitchy mm. and bitey, and his enunciation is really up and down all over the place, and he's got that trademark smile going on. Yeah. He's got his wacky hair, and yeah. he's just all over the place, all the way through the film. He goes up, he goes down. Like, one minute he's gone mad, the next minute he's, like, crying, like, oh, I'm so sorry. And he's, then he's sat down with, with Danny, and they're like, oh, yeah, blah, blah, back to normal Jack again. And then he's, like, fucking crazy again. Yeah. He's having drinks with the people, and right. suddenly he's not crazy. Now he's just a psychopath. And Yeah, but that just shows how he's broken. That's his, you know, his breaking point. He's, he's what, erratic. Jack Nicholson's broken? <laughs> Jack Torrance is, is broken. His, that's why his performance is so erratic and, and we're watching we've witnessed a man go mad He's... no we're watching Jack Nicholson go mad <laughs> listen I think The Shining is a masterpiece because yes it's a scary film it's a bit, but no other films can replicate what I'm talking about that The Shining has that's why it's considered a masterpiece that's why so many people rave about it because of that um, uh, feeling it has and it, it invokes such strong emotion in people I think people rave about it it's almost like that film that people that aren't really interested in that genre can cite because they've seen it right right I think if you speak to most fans of the horror genre you're not going to hear The Shining emerge from their lips I disagree I disagree with that Everyone knows that The Shining sets a benchmark. But this is this is like a mob culture. Just because you hear that Shining is one of the best films, so you go into the film expecting it to be the best, and then even if you don't actually believe that, you start looking for reasons why it's the best, and you just start agreeing with everyone else. It's almost because everyone says this is the best horror film. It's the best horror film. I must be wrong otherwise. I I mean I disagree with that with The Shining because I know Kubrick and his methods. Some of the scenes in The Shining made me question why they were there. You okay. question why some of the scenes were in The Shining. <laughs> yes, I did question them because I I know Kubrick's methods, and and that made me want to go out and and. And find out more about certain scenes, why they're there. The Shining is uh, different. There's meanings in that film. Um, there's questions left unanswered. And for me personally, I, I love that because you you think about it. It makes you question why why is that there? Like why is there a, a guy dressed as a bear, seemingly giving oral sex to another man in the suit at the end of the film? Why is that there? The the Shining just makes it more interesting. And I love films that do that. And I guess that's why many fans uh, love the film. But there's so many other fantastic horror films out there that have as much, if not more, to offer and to be explored about the human condition and about thoughts and fears and emotions than The Shining. But no other no other director has really delved into different themes. You've got to be kidding me. Yeah, like, uh, with uh, what I was going to mention before, the, the themes that he touches on, such as racism, um, hidden meanings regarding the moon landing, and his partaking in that, it, it, it makes you question certain uh, uh, aspects you're which right. other films no, don't no, you're tend right. to do Stephen King did a fantastic job of touching on many interesting themes within the set piece of his story these aren't Kubrick's original ideas, he's interpreting that onto screen, so what I'm questioning is what he has put onto the screen not the ideas brought up in the story, because the ideas that are presented to us, they were the machinations of Stephen King. Mm. This is about the way the themes from the original source material are presented as a film. Mm. I strongly feel that Kubrick, actually by this point, is kind of losing the plot. Mm. He is a marvellous director, so you've got Spartacus, you've got Doctor Strangelove, you've got Parts of Glory... Space Odyssey... Yeah, 2001 Space Odyssey, got Clockwork Orange, Barry Lyndon, all these classic films. Right. And then you reach the 1980s, mm. and you have The Shining, and Clockwork Orange took him to the brink. If you want a film that 
is about madness and things spiraling out of control and anarchy. I mean, that is the film for you. And right. then you move over into The Shining, I just feel he's gone too far and he's starting to move into the, a ridiculous area. And he sort of brings it back with Full Metal Jacket. Hmm. You've got half of a masterpiece there. Yeah, yeah. I mean, then Eyes Wide Shut, just, it's just mental. This reminds me of a director, maybe, who has gotten to the point where he's just untouchable and no one can give him any sort of criticism. It's all entirely him and it's too much and there's a lot of badly done things in this film and you want to look for hidden meanings but when you scrape by the surface you're just finding a path back to the novel. A lot of the ideas are his own uh, and this is... Well, fam- of the themes are his own. Not, not the, the main overarching themes, no, but... Um... A lot of ideas are his own yeah, ideas. Yeah, most of them are the ones I've brought up because they're utterly ridiculous. <laughs> Apart from maybe the jumper. Yeah. We see Danny playing with some toys um, and he gets up and he has a, a jumper that says Apollo 11. And that always stood out to me. It stood out to you as well. Um, why, why is he wearing that? Um, as I've said before, Kubrick doesn't randomly put in things. So why, why did he put that there? Um, a lot of people have seen sim- uh, other uh, shots within the film. For example, when he's playing um, on the carpet, the decoration of the carpet actually looks like the launch pad of Apollo 11, which is very interesting. So we've got that, and we've got Danny getting up and going towards room 237 with that jumper on. Is this a coincidence? Who knows? He's walking towards room 237. Now, in the original book, that wasn't the number of the room. The number of the room was... uh, I I forget now. I think it was 117 or something. 217. (laughs) Anyway, so why why did Kubrick change that? What For what reason? I've got a funny feeling you're going to tell us. I am going to tell you. (laughs) So, 237, thousand miles, is at the time... That was the distance between the Earth and the Moon. You look so happy right now. <laughs> so why, what, what, why, why is that? Why are these three pieces together in the same scene? A lot of people have said that I'm putting on my tin foil hat now. A lot of people have <laughs> uh, said that the moon landings were faked. You look rather okay. charming in a tin foil hat. <laughs> Thank you. A lot of people have said that. Kubrick was himself a part of the faking of the moon landing and that he shot some of the scenes. Is this a message to, to viewers? He's, he's obviously, he's sworn to secrecy if he had any part of uh, the faking of the moon landings. Why is that scene there? Why does he have that jumper? Why does the pattern on the carpet look like launch pads? Why is he travelling to that room with that number? And that's not the original number. Why is that? You know, there's there's many scenes like this. Um, we see Wait, it, you don't actually have an answer. Well, it could be he he could be trying to tell us that yes, the American government is trying to mask the fact that we fake the moon landings. That's nearly as ridiculous as some of the scenes in this film. Just so you know. Well, you have to question why that's there. Do you though? Of course. Well, let me continue. So, a lot of images that we see throughout the film are linked. So, for example, we know that this hotel was built on an Indian burial ground. If you look at many of the scenes in the film, there's a lot of American Indian tapestry images. I think there's one image in the uh, kitchen when we see Scatman, uh, Dick, with Danny, and they're talking about The Shining. We see an interesting shot of food products. And there's, in the background, we see an interesting shot with a red Indian on, on this food can. And it, it really stands out. It's really, it, it's put there very intentionally. And we, we see a lot of this throughout the film. Uh, we see Jack throwing a ball at a wall full of American Indian pictures and images. Why do we see that? Is this a message about America and its dominance over certain cultures? We see that with... As we mentioned before with Dick and the racism that Kubrick sort of creates here and the fact that Jack says this word nigger, does this all tie in together? When Jack mentions the white man's burden, uh, which is an idea that the white man feels that he has dominance over other cultures, is this a message 
Okay, so it's a it's a thinking man's film. It's got loads of little Easter eggs in it that if you're interested enough to go and look at, you can look at. I think it's more than Easter eggs. Well, I think it's a, okay, it's a message. So it's got points of thought or messages, hidden messages, whatever. It's got mm. lots of extra stuff in it. Yeah. Fine. But that alone, it's, it's like having a juicy steak, but some of the steak's missing. You've got like, all these other decorations around the side. There's a massive hole in the middle. Yeah. I don't give a shit that there's all this decoration. I give a shit that the steak's not as good as it could have been. And the steak's been left out to rot for a while, and now it's dried up, and it's not anywhere near as good as it would have been before. Adding all this extra, it doesn't make up for what's lacking, and it doesn't make up for the flaws in this film. I have evidence to present to the court. It's well known that Stephen King is not a huge fan. He's not. In fact, I have some direct quotes from him. This is from a recent interview with Stephen King. It's cold. I think one of the things people relate to in my books is this warmth. There's a reaching out and saying to the reader, I want you to be part of this. With Kubrick's The Shining... We're looking at these people, but they're like ants in an anthill. Aren't they doing interesting things like little insects? Jack Torrance in this movie seems crazy from the jump. Jack Nicholson I'd seen in all his biker pictures in the 50s and 60s, and I thought, he's just channeling wild angels here. Shirley Duval as Wendy is really one of the most misogynist characters ever put on film. She's basically just there to scream and be stupid, and that's not the woman that I wrote about. Okay, so that's Stephen King's opinion. Mm -hmm. I think with many films adapted from books, they're created by different people, they're different forms of art, in my opinion, and Stephen King's book was his form of art. Stanley Kubrick's was his form of art adapted from someone else's. We see this with Stephen King uh, when he tried to make The Shining as it, you know in, in TV form, which was horrendous in my opinion, and to many others. Yeah, yeah, but okay, let's let's just hold on that because okay. I think that's very unfair. Okay. For a start, yes, it's everyone's artistic whatever, but not many writers have been so upset with how it was portrayed that they've gone out and tried to do it themselves. No, that's true. There have been a lot of people that um, and have been upset with You're comparing the a very high budget, by comparison, feature film backed by a studio to something that was put out on television, mm. produced by a writer. You can't compare the two. Well, that's it. It's different forms of media. No, 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 you know? no, no. But this. It doesn't matter that The Shining's going to be better than a TV miniseries. I'm just saying that his opinion is. It is slightly more important than our opinions. Okay. You know, if anyone can criticise it, it can be him. Because he okay. wrote the damn thing. Right. He felt he'd done a complete injustice to his characters. And they were badly portrayed. And that bad portrayal reflects back to the actors and it reflects back to the director. It's not a bad film. It's just not this masterpiece that everyone touts it to be. I say everyone very loosely. In fact, quite a few people I've spoken to recently said otherwise but maybe they've seen it recently as well hmm. so just another small piece of evidence The Shining in 1981 received two Razzie nominations are you aware of the Razzies? they're the sort of Oscars for bad performances yes right. um, worst actress nominee Shelley Duvall okay. worst director nominee Stanley Kubrick interesting just putting it out there not gonna, I'm not going to comment okay just evidence. All right. Interesting. Okay, I would like to present my evidence now. The Shining has received a lot of critical acclaim. Um, if we look at different ratings from different websites, for example, IMDb, um, Empire, Film4, IGN, The Shining constantly comes out in top 10 lists of best horrors of all time. Um, it's rated 8.5 in IMDb. So a very, very strong rating there. And that leads to the conclusion that this film is widely regarded as a classic. I'd also like to just list off some other films that you might consider would be a valid number one horror film of all time. You might, if you haven't seen, you should definitely go and look at uh, Ring, the Japanese version. is a classic. Texas Chainsaw Massacre, the original version, absolute classic. 
Jaws, fantastic. You talk about tension, Jaws blows the shiny out of the water, in my opinion. Uh, the Exorcist. Now, The Exorcist kind of plays tag with The Shining for the number one spot, and I'm not sure ex- I've ex- if I exactly feel strongly about that film. Okay. Um, I don't particularly enjoy it, but many people do, so okay. it's just an alternative for people. <laughs> uh, Halloween, The Thing, Alien, Frankenstein... Bride of Frankenstein, Dracula, Psycho, Nosferatu, Saw, Evil Dead 2, Let the Right One In, Scream, The Descent, Silence of the Lambs, Peeping Tom, Night of the Living Dead, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Martyrs, if you want to look at something a bit more extreme, or if you want to see something similar to The Shining for its comedic value, Shaun of the Dead. (laughs) Well... That's a that's a big list you've got there, Alec. <laughs> that that was just skimming off the top. Right, right. I wanted to give people some really solid sure, films, as sure. opposed to some of the more debated ones like sure. The Shining. But well, look, I've seen a lot of the films that you've mentioned. Not all, but most of them. But I feel that The Shining is a an absolute masterpiece because it's more than just a scary movie. It it has more to it than other films. It still provokes thought and debate even now. There was recently released uh, a film called Room, or a documentary, sorry, called Room 237, discussing certain aspects of the film and and ideas. That hasn't happened for many films, and that just shows the uh, level of intrigue this film has. Time for closing statements. Members of the jury, The Shining, is it a good film? Definitely. It's definitely a good film. Is it a great film? No. No, it isn't. It's too flawed. It's too dated. The performances do not match that of a true classic. Yes, it has iconic scenes. Yes, it has quotable lines. And yes, it has memorable moments. I don't think that in a current context, those memorable scenes are memorable for the right reasons anymore. I find this film to be too ridiculous. And I think many people, when they approach this film, when they're new to this film, without nostalgia, they'll laugh. And they're not compelled to look for answers. I'm not going to tell you that you shouldn't watch this film. I'm not going to tell you not to enjoy it. And I'm definitely not going to tell you that it's bad, because it isn't but it is definitely not one of the best horror films of all time. It's not even close. I wouldn't put it in the top 25, maybe even the top 50. And it tops so many lists, and that just can't be right, because this film is incredibly overrated, and I implore you to give the verdict of guilty. Members of the jury, I'm proposing to you why The Shining is not overrated, and that it is not guilty of what Alec has said. The Shining evokes a certain feeling in me, and to many other people. It's this feeling of uneasiness. You just feel a dread while watching this film. You feel the tension and the atmosphere building up. We want to know more about why this child and why this character Dick have The Shining. We want to know why Jack is seeing these images, what's going on, where's where's it leading to. We leave watching the film with a sense of intrigue. We want to know more about it. We know Kubrick is a master at intentionally putting in scenes, having scenes there for a reason, not just randomly doing things. This shows especially with the making of Room 237. People are interested. We... we We have our own theories of why certain uh, scenes are there, and we want to decipher what Kubrick is trying to tell us. But more than that, we have a horror film that makes us scared, that makes us feel uneasy, and that leaves a lasting impression with us. Okay, that's all we have time for, and that wraps up the case of Movie Trialers versus The Shining. Thank you, audience, for joining us. The Shining's fate is down to your verdict. Guilty or not guilty, the decision is yours. 
I'd like to thank my guest, the defendant, certainly in no way Irish, Pat. <laughs> Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming, Pat. Have you enjoyed yourself? I, I have. I've enjoyed talking about The Shining. I hold it dear to my heart. I never thought I'd think this much or talk this much about a film that I didn't think much or talk much about after seeing. Oh, yeah, that's true. We're, we're very emotive um, regarding our opinion, so... Um, yeah, my arm has been flailing everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> it makes for interesting listening. Um, I think Wendy's had an impression of <laughs> Definitely, definitely. Um, would you come back to do another one? Yeah, definitely. I think we um, disagree on many films. I, I think I didn't know we had this much disagreement in us. We've right. always been rather close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's weird. For films, I, I think we have different ideas of what's good. So. Well, maybe. You know, maybe you were drunk. <laughs> well, anyway, I'll definitely come back well, and uh, discuss You've been films. a very eloquent speaker, and I've been very happy to have you. So oh, I hope you'll you. come back at some point. And of course. You know, lose again. <laughs> <laughs> of course, of course I'll come back to win, definitely. Okay. Thanks again. If you've enjoyed this, be sure to check out our other movie trials and be sure to have your say. Comment below. Any support will be appreciated. We have been the Movie Trialers. Goodbye for now and until next time. <laughs>